Good morning. I'm up here, Tom. Uh, well, I, I, I want to second what Derek said about uh, the worship. That was, that was great. Alex, I don't know if you're in here, but you did an awesome job on that last song. Thank you so much, as everyone did. Um, yeah, speaking of what um, Tim said about invitation, gosh, if Andrew hadn't invited Peter, we wouldn't be here because we're reading from one of his letters. So um, if you have not been with us, we are in the third part of a three-part series on the book of Jude and the book of Second Peter. Um, and just to show you the power of what we've been doing and, and, and how incredibly efficient. We're going through these two books in three weeks. Let's be honest, it would take you in probably three years. <laughs> That's the difference. Um, so if you got your Bible, pull them out. Again, we're in the book of Jude and the book of Second Peter. They're way at the end of the Bible. Uh, Jude is the last letter before the book of Revelation. And as I said, this is week three, and by way of recap, uh, in week one, we looked at Peter chapter one, where he tells his recipients to make every effort to align their lives with their position in the body of Christ. And he specifically calls them to do two things, which are to remember, and as we learned, that is not just a mental recollection, but it is also taking action on what you remember. And secondly, to continually grow in the gifts of the Spirit so that we do not become ineffective and unproductive in our lives. And then last week, we focused on the attacks that Satan wages against the church through false teachers. And this is especially dangerous as, as both Jude and Peter say they sneak into the congregation and the threat comes from inside and it tends to lead many astray. So I've titled today mess, today's message, Waiting on the patient, Patience of God. And today we're going to look at some specific things that we should be doing that will help us to remember and to grow in the gifts of the Spirit, or through the Spirit, while we wait upon the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Uh, in Jude, from the verses that Gail just read, verses 20 and 21, it says, But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. And then Peter says in uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. So the key points we're gonna be looking at from these two verses is number one, we're going to look at building ourselves up in our most holy faith. We're going to look at praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping ourselves in God's love, extended God's mercy to others as we wait upon his return, and then finally, understanding God's patience as we wait. So uh, let's take a look at these see how they apply to the situation of the churches that Jude and Peter were speaking to, and then how, what we can glean for our own lives. So taking these things one at a time. First, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. So this phrase in Jude ties back to what he said at the beginning of his letter in verse three, where he said, I felt compelled to write you and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to you, God's holy people. So Jude's reiterating to his audience the need to fight for and grow in the faith. And we talked about this previously. These are mature believers, but they still need to fight and grow. And it goes back to the title of this three-part series, which is The Battle for Our Souls. Because recall, we are in the middle of a spiritual battle that Satan is waging against God. And his target right now is the church. Those that aren't part of the church, they're on the sidelines. Those that are in the church are aligned with God, and Satan wants them to be either aligned with him, or if he can't accomplish that, at least he can take them out of the fight so that they, they become ineffective. In today's scripture, Jude tells us to build up our faith. 
And he mentions this in the context of the apostles' teaching. So in effect, what he's saying is, you have the apostles' teaching as a foundation. Now continue to build your faith upon that foundation. Second, he's saying it to the church. He's not saying it to a single person. He's saying it to that church and all of us collectively. Now, building up your faith can certainly include personal Bible study and prayer. But even personal Bible study should be shared and discussed with the community of believers. And the reason is it's the exact opposite of what these false teachers were doing. They were basing their truths, their um, theology, if you will, on dreams that no one else had. This is what they do, frankly, in cults, okay, where someone claims special revelation from God, and the next thing you know, they're in a compound somewhere drinking Kool-Aid, okay? That's, that's how it goes. So that's, this is why um, we should always test against Scripture and fellow believers, any interpretation of a dream or a word you believe is in from God or even your understanding of what you're reading in Scripture. Because remember, as we learned in our first series, our hearts are deceitful, okay? And they can lead us astray. That's why we need each other. That's why the church needs to come together, to learn together, to pray together. Third, he emphasized the fact that faith is holy, Now, this word holy simply means set aside for God. As holy people, we are set aside to God, and our faith is in him alone. Jude, again, is setting up this strong contrast between what the false teachers that were leading the people away from their holy faith and a pursuit of selfish desires. Secondly, Jude says, pray in the Spirit. Now, this is a phrase that is also used by Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, where he says in 6.18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So we know as believers that the Holy Spirit dwells inside us. In terms of, you know, praying in the Spirit or just praying, there's no clear-cut definition, well, what's the difference? What do they mean when they say praying in the Spirit? But what it alludes to is when believers are being directed to pray or worship in the Spirit, we're being encouraged to submit to and be guided by the Spirit as we pray. So to be guided by is to hear the Spirit. Whether that's verbal or not, we we seek to listen and hear what He wants. Well, if you want to hear from the Spirit, it's a prerequisite that you're in God's Word because that's the primary way that He speaks to us and gives us direction. Now, praying the Spirit can be manifest in many ways, including a simple heartfelt prayer where you feel like God's placing something on your heart to pray for yourself or to somebody else. It could be tongues. It could be prophecy. It's inclusive of all those things. That's why Paul again says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And again, Jude is contrasting how the believers should pray with the false peak false teachers who are acting under the influence of their fleshly desires and do not, as Jude says, have the Spirit. Now, if we're not alert, it can be very easy for us to follow someone who sounds good and who plays to our needs or selfish desires. They can say things like, well, what's wrong with praying for money? Doesn't God want to bless you? Don't you deserve it? You should do what makes you feel good. Doesn't God want you to be happy? And these things are not bad in themselves, right? Money in and of itself is not bad. Being happy is not bad. But be alert, because what can often happen is gradually these good things, the desires of our heart become the focus rather than God himself. And it becomes an evil desire, which really means an over-desire for something good. It replaces the place of God as first in your life. So Jude is encouraging the believers not to be led astray by this, but to make sure their prayers are aligned with the Spirit of God. In Psalm 37, it says, delight yourself in the Lord, and then he will give you the desires of your heart. So we start with the focus on delighting ourselves in the Lord, then our desires in our heart 
become aligned with his desires. Third, it says, keep yourself in God's love. Now, we know the false teachers and their followers were actively moving away from God's love. Jude is calling his audience to the opposite. And I think there's at least two key elements to what he's saying here. First is this, like remembering, is an active thing. We're actively keeping in God's love. And it reflects what Jesus commanded in John 15, 9, where he said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and remain in his love. Now, when I read scriptures like what I just quoted there from Jesus, sometimes my heart goes into fear. And let me walk you through what I mean. Maybe you're like me, maybe you're not. But when I hear, wait, if I don't keep all your commandments, then I won't remain in your love, which means you're gonna reject me and I'm going to hell. That's how my heart works. And again, the heart's deceitful, right? Right? This is a lie from the enemy. This is not what Jude is saying, and this is not what Jesus means, okay? The enemy loves to insert these types of doubts in our heart, which remember, as I said before, it's deceitful. Our heart tends toward the negative. It's part of the fall. Never forget what Paul said in Romans chapter 8. He said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he's not saying that we can be taken away from God. So what is Jude implying? Well, when he says keep yourself in God's love, he's explaining maintaining a growing relationship with God. When we wander away into sin, we distance ourselves from God. He doesn't distance himself from us. We are actively distancing ourselves from God. And thus, what happens is we can't enjoy the blessing and relationship he wants us to have in the here and now because we pulled away. So in order to not do that, we must actively work to stay close to God in ways Peter explained in 2 Peter 1, actively remembering and continuing to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. I think the second part of keeping ourselves in God's love is remembering that if we do sin or wander away, all we must do is return to him with a true heart and we draw near to him again. Understanding this is key to keeping in God's love. The problem is, as humans, we're prone to act in our will, our own will, not the Father's. And what happens is we wander off into sin, and it generates afterwards emotions in us, like guilt and shame and fear. And the enemy uses those emotions, or subconsciously, it draws us back away from God. And that's exactly what the enemy wants, right? Remember, because he wants us to be ineffective and unproductive in our walk. Well, if we're pulling away from God, that's exactly what we're going to be. However, when we actually feel these feelings, guilt, shame, fear, depression, discouragement, that should actually act as like an alert, like an alert on your phone, okay, to turn back to God. And, and really, that's all repent means is to turn back, okay? So when we feel those feelings, rather than withdrawing, rather than pulling back, we need to move in. We need to go back to God and remember we are accepted, we are welcome, because of Christ's sacrifice, nothing in all creation can keep us from the love of God. Fourth. Jude says, we need to extend God's mercy to others as we wait upon the return of the Lord. And he's referring here to, the, to um, extending God's mercy to those that have wandered off from God as we wait for God's ultimate mercy to bring us into everlasting life. So Jude 22 and 23, let me repeat again. He says, be merciful to those who doubt, Save others by snatching them from the fire, showing mercy mixed with fear. 
hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Now, there's, this is an interesting piece of scripture where um, some, some, some scriptures has three groups here and two. This is actually two groups of people that he's talking about. And I want to dig into each of them. In verse 22, the first group, these are people who are continually doubting and beating themselves up because of it. Maybe they've sinned. Maybe they've done something wrong. You know how you do this, right? You sin, you feel bad about yourself, and then you beat yourself up. Well, I'm not worthy. I'm not a believer. God doesn't love me, okay? And what he says to them, does he say you should beat them up because of their sin? No, he doesn't say that. He says, have mercy on them, uh, that they would come back to God. The second group is a little different. They're represented as being as being very defiled, which means they're, they're corrupted by sin. Uh, this is what the stained clothing represents in verse 23, where he says, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. For this group, Jude, Jude is saying, don't give up on them. Also show them mercy, but treat them differently, okay? They're corrupt. They're very close to judgment, which is represented by the fire. And Jude is warning his readers to be wary of having their corruptness rub off onto them. Now, part of me would think that Jude would want to condemn these people and say, you know, just, you know, give them over to Satan, let them go to hell. Um, Because they're so blatantly sinful and they're leading others into sin, right? Including the false teachers, right? This is what this, these uh, two books are really all about. But what is so fascinating is that's not what he's saying. And in fact, this section actually comes uh, out of the prophet Zechariah. And I'm going to read from you Zechariah, who has a series of visions, and this is one of them. This comes from Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, and it says, uh, Zechariah says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. So you have Zechariah the prophet in this vision in the throne room of God, seeing what's going on. And Satan is accusing Joshua. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man, listen to it, like a burning stick snatched from the fire. You should hear the similarities in the scripture from Jude. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel And the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. So my wife, Kimberly, uh, just completed a study of the prophets, including Zechariah. So she shared with me what she taught on this specific verse. And it's it's really interesting. I'm gonna share from that. So Zechariah, to put it in context, was was a prophet in the Old Testament when the Israelites were returning from the exile in Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem. So if you remember Nehemiah, the guy who rebuilt the wall, he was a contemporary of Nehemiah. The Joshua mentioned here uh, is not the Joshua from the book name. This Joshua was the high priest at the time. And as such, he represented all of the nation of Israel before God. His filthy clothing, like the clothing that Jude talks about, represents their sin. Satan is sitting there accusing them based upon their sin. This is all Satan sees. And his accusation honestly is valid, okay? There shouldn't be any sin or anything corrupt in God's presence. Yet God, while Satan sees the sin and the evil deeds, God also sees the evil deeds. Don't don't think that he doesn't. But he sees beyond that to the people themselves. And he knows that they are not evil. So God's solution is not like Satan to berate them, but to cleanse them of their sins. So this is the analogy Jude is making when he says that even though these people's clothing is stained by corrupt flesh, even though the sins what they're doing and they're leading others into is horrible, and they're in the fire like they're they're near damnation, right? His, feet, his readers should treat them as God treated his people Israel. They should attempt to save them by snatching them out of the grips of the fire. Now let's take a look 
We've been in the book of Jude. We're going to jump over into 2 Peter. And let's see what Peter says about patience as we wait for the day of the Lord. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 9, I'm going to read. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and read along with me, starting in verse 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forgot that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some, I would say as many, understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Hear that. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. So in that day, we're talking about, this is, you know, after the apostles had passed passed on, uh, or, or many of the apostles, many of the believers and even the apostles thought during their lifetime that Jesus would come back in their lifetimes. That was an active thought, right? He's coming back and he's coming back soon. Thus the false teachers said, well, hey, wait a minute. Those apostles that were saying this are dead, and yet Jesus hasn't come back. And they even, these, these false teachers even seem to make the jump to, you know, nothing really ever changes as a matter of fact. Maybe God doesn't even exist. All these prophecies that he makes, nothing's happening. However, Peter, con- Peter mentions that they conveniently seem to have forgotten that God created the world by water, and by water he destroyed all living things, reminding his readers of the truth in the scriptures. Peter then accuses them of acting like their ancestors who, di- who have died, accusing the false teachers of acting like their ancestors who have died, who didn't believe God would judge them due to his patience. And this takes us all the way back to the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 28, God is leading his people into the promised land. They're on the precipice of the promised land. And if you recall, he gives Moses, a series of blessings and curses to share with the people. It says, hey, if you do good, I'm going to bless you this way. If you do evil, I'm going to curse you this way. And after sharing that, God says to Moses regarding the Israelites, these people will soon prostitute themselves to foreign gods of the land they are entering. They'll forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. And in that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. Notice what God says here. He says, soon, they will soon prostitute themselves. And in that day, I will become angry, forsake them and ultimately destroy them. Now, as we read through the story, we know that the Israelites did quickly prostitute themselves or pursue other gods, false gods of the nations around them. But God did not complete his judgment on the Israelites and completely wipe out Jerusalem for another 900 years, literally almost a thousand years. And remember what Peter says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, thank God, he is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The same was true with the Israelites, with the church that Jude and Peter is talking to, as with us now. Sometimes we wonder, why is God waiting so long, right? Why is he taking so long, especially with the suffering and the evil we see in the world? 
but he is not slow, but patient, wanting everyone to come to repentance. We're not much different from the false teachers sometimes when you think about it in the way we think. I often wonder and get angry at God because he doesn't bring judgment against those people I see that have committed something evil against me or I read about in the news and just committing evil in the world. I want swift judgment for them. But oddly enough, I'm fine with God being patient with me because I don't want swift judgment on me. How quick I forget the patience he's shown me, giving me time to repent again and again to come back to him. Now, I'm sure you good people never think that way. Um, But that's the difference in perspective. You know, God is like the parent of a young child, right? Uh, Think about a child who you want to put the toys away. And you say, okay, time to put the toys away. And they keep playing, they keep playing. You go, okay, I'm going to count to three. One, Heather, two, two and a half, two and three quarters, right? And we drag it out. Well, God's dragging it out for thousands of years. It's the same concept. Uh, I mean, think about a child. Waiting a month or a week for a child is like forever, right? I mean, if there's a child in here right now listening to me, he's probably thinking, this guy's going on forever. Maybe some of you are thinking that. Um, But that's how children think compared to us the difference in how we think versus God is even more pronounced. His perspective is so different. So when we think or we hear people say, I can't believe a loving God allows all this evil and not do anything about it, remember, he wants that evil less than you and less than me. But he also wants those people to come to him. It's his patience his long-suffering, his forbearance and compassion. That is why he has not returned again. That is why judgment has not yet happened. Romans 2, 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? This is the same patience he wants us to extend to others. So as I mentioned at the start of the series, we are in the midst of a spiritual battle that has been going on since Adam and Eve showed up in the garden because remember who showed up right after him. Satan and the accuser has been attacking humanity throughout history. And since Christ established the church, One of Satan's best strategies is the inside job, bringing corruption from within the church by false teachers and pulling his children away. Satan's goal in doing this is to make us ineffective and unproductive in the kingdom of God here and now. Jude and Peter instructed them and us to contend for our faith by actively remembering who God says we are and to continue growing in the fruit of the Spirit. Today we read that as we wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus to bring us into the completeness of eternal life, we're to be actively remembering and growing in the Spirit. And he gave us, they gave us some great examples. Number one, again, build ourselves up in the faith, which is only placed in God, not in crazy dreams or visions or doctrines that do not align with the Word of God. Second, we are to be praying in the Holy Spirit for all things, making sure that our prayer aligns with the will of God, not with our selfish desires. Third, keep ourselves in God's love by actively being in his word, pursuing him. And if we do sin, don't allow feelings of fear, guilt, and shame to keep us away, but that they would act as an alert to go back to our Father who wants nothing more than for us to come back. And finally, we are to extend God's patient mercy to others as he has with us and continues to extend with us and those around us, all the while being wise to protect ourselves from those 
that are enmeshed in a life of sin. So if you, if you know God and you, you're struggling with those feelings of shame or guilt and doubt, you know what? We've got people that are going to be up here at the end of the service. Come on up and share it. It's nothing any of us haven't been through or maybe are even going through right now. Remember, we're in this together. We are a church. We need to share these things with each other. Nobody here is an island. I mean, I, I, could, share, I, say, I could share for quite a long time uh, the different things that I have done and haven't done that caused me to be ashamed and the times that it has pulled me away. So this is not unique to any of us. It's part of our fallen condition. But remember, because of Christ's sacrifice, God does not see just your sin. He sees it, but it's taken care of. What he sees is you. He sees you as good. He sees you as accepted. And he sees you as his beloved child. And finally, if, if you don't know Jesus, you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, and you want to know what it's like to feel free from guilt and shame, come on up and talk to these people at the end of the service. You do not need to feel that way. You are loved, you are accepted, and you are holy children of God. Amen.